Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to crown the I'm Joshua Kemble, and welcome to Joshua Kemble's live stream. I've been a freelance illustrator and graphic designer for over 20 years. I was an art director for nine years. And when I'm not art directing and working on illustrations and graphic designs, I'm working on comic books and graphic novels, and that's usually what I do during my streams. And while conversations can go all over the place on this stream, from spicy and entertaining to goofy and silly, one thing stays consistent throughout every stream. I'll always be working on art. So pull up a chair, get your art supplies out, and get ready for an entertaining show that'll keep you company while you work on your own personal art projects. This is Joshua Kemble's Art Stream. All right, welcome to my live stream. Uh, I am Joshua Kimball, as I said in the intro. Um, so it's been a while since I've streamed, other than art casters, obviously, I've been keeping up with. Uh, but um, I've been just juggling a lot and uh, still consistently working on comics and stuff like that. But um, it's definitely one of those things where I keep intending to live stream and then I will just kind of skip it. So um, no excuses. I'm just going to start live streaming now. So today what's on the agenda is, um, I have been on my stream very gradually going through all the guitars in my, uh, guitar collection. If you'd call it a collection, it's just a bunch of tools. Um, I enjoy guitars a lot. And so I will start off the stream by going over, uh, guitar number, um, 10, uh, so we've gone through nine guitars so far. So we're going to go into guitar number 10 um, and kind of walk through what I like about it, what I get out of it and stuff like that. And then we're going to jump into working on uh, Not Death But Love, the uh, strange supernatural story of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, which is the graphic novel that I'm working on for Turner Publishing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, somewhat profound stuff that happened the other day when I was working in the yard, in the backyard, uh, taming this, uh, basically we just have like a forest back there. And, uh, and I've gotten like halfway through like clearing out this forest of weeds in our backyard and, uh, had a really, uh, nice moment of clarity the other day, which was kind of nice. And it's been a, a clarity that's been building since I left my position as an art director. And, um, I'm, kind of eager to talk about that a little bit. And also I might talk a little bit about determinism um, because it, again, it's something I'm, I'm not fully grasping, but it's compelling and it's a really interesting philosophy that I've been kind of delving into a little bit, thinking about a little bit in my own little armchair kind of way. Uh, but most of what the stream is going to be today is just, again, just the usual thing of we're going to work on comics hang out, talk, goof around, and uh, and whatever. So if you're joining us, uh, welcome. And uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to try to kind of get this working to where you guys can hear the guitar. It, it Oddly enough, is not going to work as well as an acoustic because I just have a tiny little practice amp. Uh, my, my main amp is at my buddy's house uh, where we're recording a lot. Um, so I, I just have like a little tiny Dan Electro honey tone amp and then a small pedal board um that uh that i'll be running through just to show you hopefully so i will hopefully respond like hopefully there's some people watching because uh it would be nice if once i get everything hooked up if you guys can tell me if you can hear it um and if the tones are okay and stuff like that so um what i will introduce you to is guitar number 10 uh let me run through the the nine we've already kind of gone over real quick just for fun um, so we started with the Squire Stratocaster, the, the Strat 2, which was my second guitar. My first guitar was a guitar called a Synsonics, which we weren't able to go through, but I don't own that anymore, so I didn't include it in my list of guitars that I currently own. Um, the next one was a Jasmine Acoustic, which was like an off-brand Takamine. That was my first uh, real acoustic guitar. Uh, the next was my Squire Telecaster, which was my first new guitar, 
uh, the, the other ones I had kind of acquired, um, in different ways. Um, and then actually, you know, what's funny, uh, the Jasmine might've been my first. Then we went into a Siegel S six, which was my first solid top acoustic guitar and tonal. You probably the best guitar I'd ever bought. Um, uh, then we got into the modded Telecaster Squire, uh, which was that red uh, Telecaster with a P90 on it. It's a little crunchy, and I modded uh, quite quite heavily uh, to with new electronics and stuff like that, and I love that guitar. Then we got into the Sterling Bass, the Stingray that I bought so that I could track uh, bass lines, and it's a great bass guitar. I don't think I need another bass guitar. Um, I'm not really a bassist, so I think having one good, solid bass guitar is good enough for me. Um, then we got into the Fender American Telecaster, which is the best guitar I own and probably my favorite guitar. Then we got into the Luna Soprano, um, VM Soprano Ukulele, which was the first ukulele I bought. And I use that for Got Notes, and I still use it for the song Got Notes. And then I use it for recording all the time. Then we got into our Gibson SG standard, which was the first uh, Gibson that I bought. And I was my whole life kind of trepidatious about Gibsons, but I always loved them because of Ian McKay and um, and uh, Sunny Day Real Estate, uh, Jeremy Ennick, uh, a lot of a lot of guys that I really admired. Uh, nonetheless, also, come on, Angus Young <laughs> um, and SG is a really cool, iconic guitar. And I always felt like, well, I'm more of a Fender guy. So if I go Gibson, I'd probably fit an SG a little more than like this giant heavy bodied um, uh, uh, Les Paul. But that gets us to, so I was playing around on the the SG and I loved it. And then I suddenly wanted a Les Paul. <laughs> I wanted to try out a Les Paul. I was like, okay, it's time. And at this point in time, Epiphone had done a release. So now we're getting into guitar number 10, which is the one we're going to review. Well, I'll, I'll just kind of show you guys what I get out of it. And um, so Epiphone uh, released a series of guitars called Inspired by Gibson. And they were getting like rave reviews. And I looked at the specs on their 59 uh, Les Paul. Um, and it, it, it's like it's a beautiful guitar and the Inspired by Gibson 59 Les Paul. It's like a matte uh, finish on it. It's got, you know, all the kind of fretwork and inlays that you'd expect. It has a bone nut. Um, it has, and here's the really interesting thing. It has all the hardware of an actual Gibson Les Paul. And so um, all the hardware is a Gibson Les Paul's hardware, uh, including Gibson Burst Bucker pickups. And so I was like, okay, that's pretty cool for like the price range, considering like a new Les Paul with similar specs would have been insane. The price range was probably about a fourth to a fifth to maybe a sixth of the equivalent from Gibson. So I was like, you know what? Let's try it. So it comes with like a nice vintage case uh, with the uh, the lovely pink interior that one would expect. You, you really want that um, Pepto-Bismol color on the inside of your uh your guitar and uh it just it arrived and it pleasantly surprised me it played if well as well if not better than my gibson sg which is a testament to epiphone really stepping up their game with these inspired by gibson so needless to say it also provided a really unique tone um, and i can't quite understand why the tone is so much different than the sg it might be that it's an Epiphone and the Gibson is a Gibson. Um, but I think it's the Les Paul versus SG. They just have a different vibe. Um, less accessible frets than the, uh, the SG. The SG has way easier upper fret access. But uh, but let's get into it. So let's uh, let me show you this. I'll play a little loop and then we'll get into uh, working on comics. So because you guys aren't here. I'm not like a famous musician. <laughs> um, you're here probably to hang out and work on art. But uh, I'm let me appease myself a little bit and we'll uh, we'll we'll do um, uh, just a playthrough of the guitar with a loop. And just let me know, um, Mr. Floss 
commented in the chat saying, do you like Star Wars? I 100% like Star Wars. Um, I, I, uh, it impacted my life in a very interesting way because I grew up with Star Wars. So it's like, especially the original uh, trilogy is just a part of my soul. However, I'm not like a Star Wars um, aficionado. Um, my sister was like wacky into Star Wars when we were kids and subscribed to like Lucasfilm magazine and stuff like that. And because of that, a lot of that rubbed off on me. But I also don't know all the trivia of Star Wars. So hopefully that uh, that makes sense. OK, so we're going to get into um, we're going to get into drawing some stuff, uh, not drawing. We're going to get into playing guitar. Um, and then Mr. Floss asked, do you like Star Wars again? And, uh, I will say, yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So let me know if you guys can hear this. So we're going to basically play, uh, this beautiful, um, Epiphone Les Paul, and I'm going to try to navigate in a way where you guys can kind of see it, uh, and maybe move the mic. Uh, Paul said, do you like that? that board game operation. Uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, I, the board game operation is kind of awesome. I, I always found it pretty fun. All right. So here we go. Uh, let me know if you guys can hear this. Can you hear that? Okay. So this is on the, uh, the rhythm, the upper, uh, basically the neck pickup. And uh, we'll just create a little loop and then play over it. Uh, and I have no plans for this, so we're just going to kind of roll with it. I also need to move this cable so it's not in the way. Okay, let's see here. Got a little loop. Now we'll go to the uh, we'll go to the um, the bridge pickup. Okay. 
was about to get kind of lost in that and just keep going or just try a different thing, you know? <laughs> Anyhow, um, I was going to just keep going, but, but this is not a guitar stream. So, um, uh, Paul was saying, when you're done, you're going to have to play this back and listen to it. Did it sound OK? Um, so anyhow, hopefully you guys could hear it. Um, this is a great guitar, I would say, on a budget. If you can't afford a Les Paul, but you want a Les Paul, the 59 Epiphone standard is just like killer. Like it's um, it's just got all the tones you want. You know, you can definitely do your. Uh... Right. It's just got that. It's just, it's, it's rad. Um, Paul said there's something happening that's weird with the sound and I can't quite explain it. Um, uh, also Scott said, what do you like better picking or grinning? Interesting. Um, Paul, I wonder what's, is something weird still happening with the sound currently? Hopefully not. Um, picking or grinning. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I think that's a reference and I'm not catching it anyhow. So, um, that's basically where we're kind of at with the guitars. But again, like this is a really good one. Um, I've always enjoyed this one, uh, since I got it, it's just got a really nice warm tone. And again, it's got, you know, Gibson burst bucker pickups and, uh, the, the craftsmanship on it is meticulous. Um, and the specs, you know, really feel like a 59. And I love the fact that while it's not a nitro finish, um, it is like a, a, a semi gloss, which is kind of awesome. The only thing that'll suck about that is as I play this more, the back of the neck will become less matte and more kind of shiny. But, um, uh, oh, Paul was saying, no, it sounded weird when you were trying to record it and then it sounded fine on the playback. That's interesting. <laughs> um, and it, like, so basically that's, that's a, that's it for guitar number 10. But the, the thing I use this for in my arsenal is if I need something that's got like a warm character to it, uh, like if I need something with like sharp clarity, I'm playing my Telecaster uh, for like a electric guitar. If I need something with like a quack, I'm, I'm playing my Telecaster. And that's generally the type of tone I do is like a really bright, uh, pinchy, like quacky kind of guitar. But if I need something warm and more kind of tonal that feels more like uh, ancient or has like a, a crunch to it and it has that humbucker overdrive, but it's not quite as heavy as the um it, it's not quite as heavy as like an sg whereas an sg is just a rock and roll machine and yeah it has okay cleans and stuff like that but your sg ideally is just going to be like mainly its character is going to come out in overdrive this thing the character has a lot of depth and clarity but also warmth and a little bit of fuzz to it it's not quite as crisp and clear as a telecaster which makes sense because it's humbuckers and those are always going to sound a little different but i love this guitar it plays great it feels great the weight is pretty heavy but it's less paul it's a light less paul i think it's like seven point something um uh oh nice paul said uh my dad's favorite show was hee-haw so anyhow i i love this guitar and i think it's a good option for anybody who might want a less paul or adding a less paul to their arsenal because it's a different tone than you know the fender family that i tend to um abide with and uh and it's a great feeling guitar and it's very versatile and i gotta say there's something about this neck that i really like too um and the weight even though it's heavier than i'm used to because again i'm a fender guy um it it, it kind of feels more similar to a telecaster than an sg um but which has like a little bit of neck dive um although my sg is okay it doesn't neck dive too much but anyhow my point is it adds another thing to the arsenal. Um, I've definitely used this to record some tracks um, and I will use it again uh, when the time comes where I need that tone um, or if I'm going to, you know, play a cover of Sweet Child of Mine or something. So now with that being said, we're going to go to working on comics 
And uh, that's what we're going to do right now. But anyhow, uh, first we'll go to a trailer while I get this all put away. And then uh, and then we will work on comics uh, for a good hour or so, I think. At least an hour or two, hopefully. Um, so here is the... Well, it's been a while, so let's let's do Frank Salazar's trailer. I absolutely love this thing, and I'll be back without a guitar. But again, if you're looking for an SD that's in a budget, um, and you want a beautiful player, maybe it's not quite a Gibson, but it's it's as close as they've ever gotten. Uh, this '59 uh, Les Paul reissue, plus you get this beautiful little uh, limited edition um, since 1873 back plate. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful, yeah, it's got like the same pentometers, the, uh, the same toggle and Jack, uh, vintage style case comes with it, which is cool. So you don't have to fork out the extra hundred or two for a case. Um, it's a good guitar. So, uh, and it's pretty, look at that. That looks pretty, you know, anyhow. Um, all right. Uh, let's get to the trailer and then we'll get to, uh, to comics. Our heroic adventurers fought orcs, monsters, sorcerers, necromancers. Now they find themselves in front of a mystical library. What shall they find? It's all in the roll of the dice. We've come this far. There's great power behind this door. I can feel it. We just have to get past it. This door is no match for my axe. I shall chop it down. You always want to use brute strength. Why don't you try knocking? We'll try it your way. You may enter. The library is open to all those who seek knowledge. Feel free to look through our tomes. Maybe you'll find the answers you seek. I sense great power here, and it's behind those shelves. Indeed, there are powerful items hidden behind these shelves, but you can only get there through the enchanted words. Do you have those words? I believe I do. Tremble before the crem. No. There is great power. Look at that glove. Must be so powerful. That is not where I sense this power. I must get closer. I found them. I found these sacred manuscripts written by Joshua Kembo. Behold, I now possess... Two stories and Jacob's apartment. Please tell us more about two stories and Jacob's apartment. And who is Joshua Kemble? Zeric Award winning cartoonist Joshua Kemble is a freelance artist, graphic designer, and author. Two Stories is a confessional graphic memoir that grapples with questions of faith, mental illness, depravity, and ultimately redemption in a fallen world. Jacob's Apartment is a coming of age graphic novel in the vein of Ghost Road and Fun Home. It weaves together the threads of spiritual faith, identity, purpose, love, and lost to create an engrossing world in which waking and sleeping dreams collide. You have made your choice. The passage is now closed. Wait, can I get that glove? No. Oh, all right, let's go. All right, guys. Um, now we're working on comics, so we're going to be coloring page 103 of Not Death But Love, The Strange Supernatural Story of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, I guess that Paul, I guess, um, what Scott was referencing there was hee haw, which, which is kind of cool. I didn't, I, I actually know nothing about hee haw. I should, uh, look into that. It sounds kind of fun to dig into. So, um, so yeah, so what we're going to do is just basically work on the flat colors for this right now. I've laid out like the white, um, on the page, and then we're going to kind of work from there. Uh, I'll pull down the thing a little bit so that it, it's a little more visible. 
And we're just going to go through and color each one of these panels. Um, so far in the story, so we're at a point, I'm not going to recap the whole thing at this point. I've been doing that for a while, and I feel like maybe we'll just catch up to this scene. So in this scene, Sophie, who had seen home uh, as a spiritualist, like conjuring uh, things and like conjuring the dead and like um, doing, you know, making tables float and all sorts of stuff like that. And she wants to know his trick, like how, how he does what he does. And he's basically said, you know, like, um, you know, come, basically come visit me sometime and maybe we'll talk about it. So then she shows up. She's basically visiting him alone, a man alone in his uh, the place of residence where he's staying with the Rhymers, uh, which is unheard of, like in Victorian era. Um, uh, an unchaperoned woman alone with a man, um, a strange man, not a man. So it's kind of it's kind of shocking. So anyhow, home is being kind of forward in their conversation. And she's basically saying, hey, you know, you said you could be of service to me. There's nobody who can duplicate your feats. I want to learn from you. And he's like, what are you going to offer me? And she's basically saying money. I, I'm paraphrasing because it's a lot of text. Uh, and he's like, ha, I don't need money. I, I got money just floating out of my ears. Like I, I'm very famous. So like money is not going to be a thing. And then um, and then she's saying, I understand you're recently engaged to a woman who, who's wealthy. And he's saying, yes, but there are several ways in which my betrothed does not interest me in the least and like creepily touching her chin. And then uh, she says, you forget yourself, Mr. Home. I am a respectable married woman, which is a little interesting the way it's written, because it's it's kind of like, is she really being sincere there or is there a level of like kind of flirting and uh an indication there because otherwise why would she bring up him being engaged to a woman of generous means and stuff like that so it's kind of this interesting thing um paul said picking and grinning is a southern phrase for guys having a good time playing music i did not know that <laughs> and i lived in texas and i had a neighbor who was like a bluegrass guy uh, that was friends with our family when I was really little. Um, so I should have heard that phrase and I didn't. Um, what is what is wrong with my my soul? I've lost my rep as a guitarist now. Um, anyhow, so basically the uh, that's where we're at. And what we're going to do is continue this scene and get the colors done. But it's you know, it's it's an interesting scene. Um. And I can't wait to get to the next part. The thing I, I've mentioned this before, but one of the things that's hard about comics and maybe, you know, Paul definitely will understand this because I think, Paul, you're done, right? Are you completely done with the uh, with the new Perez book? Um, and then obviously Scott is about to finish his uh, almost like decade long project of Young and the Dead, which is really exciting. But I think both of you guys will understand this. It, it, one of the fun things and the insanely uh, patience trying things about doing comics is you're making a story you kind of want to see, but it's in like unbelievably slow motion. So there's like this excitement to get to the next parts because it's like, man, I want to see what this is going to look like. And this next part's going to be so cool. And then this tedium, <laughs> you know, of like, slowly getting there but then the excitement when a new scene happens because it's like finally i've been staring at this same scene for 16 hours or whatever um uh paul said just got some touch-ups to you nice congrats paul that's a huge hurdle to get to um but yeah so like so yeah so i'm actually really excited to see the next scene but it's gonna take a while we're almost there. We're through the bulk of the work. Because uh, on this project, the bulk of the work is kind of in the pencils and in the shading. And then after that, it goes fairly quickly. But, you know, if I think about it, each page probably takes me about 20 hours. <laughs> I'd like to think it doesn't. But I think each page takes like probably 16 to 20 hours. Um. 
And, you know, maybe, I don't know. I, that's, that would be my guess. Um, anyhow, so, um, which is kind of sad. Maybe they don't take that long. I don't know. I'm, I'm like thinking like thumbnail, rough, pencils, uh, shading, and then, and then, uh, color, uh, probably, probably about 16 to 20 hours, 16 at best. I, I'm guessing I might be over estimating the amount of time, but it, it does take a while. And, you know, point being, that means I'm living with each little paused moment for like a really long time. Uh, Paul said rule 538 of making comics. Don't get excited. I think you have to get excited, though. You have to be in it. Um, Because it's like. I mean, you know, obviously, I know I know um, Paul's joking around, but you know what I mean? It's like. If you're not enjoying it or getting excited about different parts of the process, then what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, um, but um, OK, this is going to tie into I was going to talk about the other day I was working in the backyard and there's this giant forest of weeds that we've we've got to take care of because the problem is, first off, it's just like a bunch of weeds and I have bad allergies, so it makes like all the bad allergy stuff like fly through our house. Like it just, you know, we have air conditioning and stuff like that, but still the, the allergy stuff finds a way to just seep into my, uh, my sinuses and just like destroy my life. So, um, we have to do the backyard and, you know, in the past we've been like lucky enough, fortunate enough to, to pay people to do it. Um, uh, the past few years, cause we've done it manually and it's been just like a headache and a nightmare and really difficult to do um and so in the past we've been fortunate enough to have the budget to be able to have somebody else do it which is great um and again you know like ideally you do everything yourself but um you know i i did the math on it at the time and it just was like i'd make more not doing it than doing it um like having somebody else do it would allow me to make more um not doing it. I don't know if that makes sense, but, uh, things have changed. Um, I have changed careers recently and that means, uh, you know, being a little, um, more budget conscious. And so, um, my, your Magnum PI, uh, phone is ringing. (laughs) My, my wife is the coolest person on the planet. She has Magnum PI's theme song as her ringtone. How cool is that? Um, anyhow, and I mean the original, the OG Magnum PI, not like the reboot nonsense that I will never watch in my entire life, uh, because that is one of those ones that I'm like, I don't care if you rebooted it. I don't want to see it. <laughs> it's not my Magnum PI. Anyhow. Um, so. So, yeah, so we, so basically I had to do the yard uh, myself this year and uh, and which is not a bad thing, but it's like. So then, you know, I'm like halfway through this project because this is definitely like a couple weekends project. It's not like you can just go out there and like mow it and be done. Um, and I got halfway through it like yesterday and I worked in the yard for about four or five hours. And it because we're on spring break and right now I work for the school district. So it's like, you know, spring break, I kind of get off, which is cool. Um, and currently, you know, it's like a really great time to do freelance and stuff like that, to make up for the time during that, that I'm not making income. Um, so anyhow, so, but I had like the time to kind of put into the yard, uh, and free up this weekend so that I can start creating a syllabus and also, you know, do Easter stuff with the kid. Cause you want to have Easter baskets and fun if you're, you got a young child. So anyhow. Um, I'm in the yard. I'm, I'm doing this work. It's grueling. It's like hot labor. It's, it's crazy. It's like these weeds are so thick. They're like a, a, you know, a giant tree, like half of them have become like tree thick. Like when I pull out a weed, it would look like I pulled out a rod of bamboo, you know, <laughs> that, I mean, and it's everywhere because it's desert. So in our desert environment, it's like, 
you would think, oh, desert, it's dry. Nothing's going to grow there. No, deserts and weeds like weeds like thrive in deserts. Like it's wild how how like quick and, and crazy they get. And again, like we have to kind of take care of it because not only are my allergies bad, but our dogs will get like little prickers and stuff from the weeds, you know, when they dry a little bit because they look all green and pretty and then they dry and have like weapons on them. (laughs) So we have to like we don't want those weapons out there for the dogs to like step on and get their paws hurt, stuff like that, which also means hurt dogs and vet bills and it costs a lot. So it's like one of those things of like it it just has to be done so i'm doing this grueling work you know and um i finish it up and i sat on a swing we have in the backyard and i realized i hadn't really sat on the swing in the backyard you know honestly like in like years like just to like chill like after doing some hard work and i sat there with like a beer and, you know, like a reward beer, like, hey, good job. You worked for four hours, manual labor and got some stuff done. And I just felt I thought about it. And I was like, right now, my career on paper. Um, I mean, I do freelance and stuff like that. But what I'm doing right now for like my main income is something like somebody with like no education. uh no, you know, bona fides or anything like that could probably like just do and, you know, sign up for it and do. And like it, so it's not like highly qualified, skilled labor. OK. Um, and so it's definitely not like a status job. It's not a job like my previous position as an art director where you'd like say art director. People are like, wow, that's a pretty cool job. You know, it's not this isn't like a high status thing. Um, our finances are a little tighter than they used to be, you know? And so like on paper, like everything that's happened in the last year, a lot of people would look at and be like, man, this guy had a really bad year. But what's weird is I have never been happier in my, like in, in years, in like a decade. Cause like I, you know, I was, I was looking at our yard with like it's weeds and everything. I was like, I love this yard. And I was thinking, you know, about like my wife and I'm like, I love my wife. I love my kid. Um, you know, I, I like my guitars. I like uh, my dogs. I like um, I like where I am. Like, weirdly enough, like I'm very happy with where I am as a human. So like kind of what I'm doing for a living could like mean, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it's nice to make a living and I will continue to strive to you know, get somewhere. Um, But I was realizing, like, if I only focus on, you know, this is a cliche, but it's like, if I just focus on the destination of like, man, you know, I'm going to do this comic so that I'll have a book and then hopefully the book will like do gangbusters and like, you know, then things will change. Then everything will change. Then things will work. It's the thing I'm striving for and it's going to get there. And then you do that thing and then the next thing comes and it's like, OK, well, once I get that, you know, or using the guitars that I've been showing as an example. You know, it's like it's fun to get guitars and and um, it's nice to have them in your arsenal. And I love them. It's one of my favorite things. But it's like, I, you know, I could own, you know, 500 guitars and it's still never going to be enough guitars. Um, I could, you know, get a, a career with the coolest title on the planet and, and you know, direct it. Well, I probably couldn't, but I'm saying even if I did and directed like an Oscar winning movie and got all the accolades, all the awards, you know, 99 percent of people are writing reviews saying, man, this guy's a genius. It's like, it's still not going to be enough. Um, And what I realized, you know, and I've realized this for, you know, quite a few years, but I feel like it kind of came full circle with me finally not being an art director because I had years of just anxiety about that, like leaving my position as an art director because it was like, oh man, everything will collapse, you know, because everything like rests on me and my income, you know, because I'm like the breadwinner and, all of that stuff, you know? And so like I had this whole 
structure like arched in my like made up in my mind of like all the negative things like all the worst things in the world would happen if i lost that job or left that job and you know even to the point where when i was at that job and i kind of actually didn't like it <laughs> um i just stayed there because i was like uh you know it was like out of fear of like man everything will collapse because everything's balancing on my shoulder and now that I think about it, it's kind of like this weird thing because I always criticize people who are like Ayn Randian, you know, types who are like, there are atlases in this world that the whole world is balancing on. And I'm like, wow, get over yourself. You know, <laughs> like it's it's it, like no one's that important. Um, and and then it, but what's funny is here I was like being the person who's like, no, I am that important. Like this is that important like everything i have is in response to like my hard work and i was very much viewing things that way whether i was aware of it or not and what i've realized is like by letting that go like everything has worked fine and there's been changes and stuff like that but it's like nothing collapsed like the world didn't stop like um the world still revolves right it's not <laughs> And the thing is, I'm still really fortunate to have things you just can't buy. And that's pretty cool. And it's like, I, I just, I don't know, like, um, it, it's weird, but it's like I was sitting on the swing or whatever. And I was just like, man, that's that's pretty rad. And um, I like that I've gotten to that point where right now it's like, I want to finish this comic and I'm not super like, uh, you know cool. If this thing blows up, that'd be great. If not, that's okay too. I made a good book, you know? And like, that's kind of okay. Like I'm not needing much more than that. Um, and so like, I'm still ambitious and I'm still going to chase stuff and things like that. But I guess my point is it was just an interesting realization. Um, thinking about like the younger me who would get just you know, I would get angry or I would get frustrated um, if things, you know, that I worked really hard for and planned for, you know, fell apart or went a different direction than my plan. Um, and almost to like an absurd extent like that, I didn't notice at the time. And uh, and I think it's interesting getting to maybe this is just part of getting older and potentially maybe wiser or maybe stupider. Maybe I just get stupider as I get older. Um, but I just, I, I, I don't know. There's just this real beauty in the fact that, um, that like what I'm working for is not going to be getting me anywhere better than where I am now. Um, and, and I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like where I am now, we have a house that needs a lot of work. You know, we got a budget that's tight. Um, I've got, you know, jobs that need to get done and probably too much work. And I have like a new career thing that's like intimidating and weird. Uh, and yet in the midst of that, what I have right now is everything that I would be working hard to gain anyway. Um, because like at the end of the day, like you could have everything in the world and, uh, and not have the presence of mind to like look at the thing you have or the things you have and just kind of be cool with it. Like, so maybe this isn't like the most profound thing, but it was a really interesting day of just kind of sitting on this swing, thinking about these things and realizing like I have a really like, it's going to sound cliche, but a very blessed life. Um, and not because of like all the things that I have, but, um, but more like the people I have, and, uh, you know, family, and then also just like the opportunity, um, the opportunities I've been given, you know, it's, I don't know, it's an interesting thing to kind of realize. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe the, um, maybe this is just part of a, a aging or something. I don't know. I'd love to hear what you guys think about. So that's, uh, one thing I was thinking about the other day. Um, and I felt really good. And I actually spent a good like maybe 15 to 20 minutes just kind of sitting on the porch, sipping a beer and the back patio or whatever. I guess not porch. Um, I don't know what these things are called, dude. Um, but yeah, I sat there and just enjoyed it, you know. So um, 
yeah and i and i was realizing like i need to remember to take time to do those things with the things that i've been given you know um rather than just constantly feeding this like consumerist machine of like the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Cause that's just a cycle that doesn't end and it doesn't ever, you know, it's the, uh, it, it's, um, uh, nature hates a vacuum kind of thing, you know, where it's, um, uh, you know, there, there's a void and you're going to do anything you can to fill it. And it's never going to be full. Um, seeing this like gas filling station nonsense, you know, where you just drive and drive and drive and refill and refill and refill. It's like, sometimes it's good to like stop and realize like the road you're on is, is actually pretty gorgeous and you didn't necessarily need to like head anywhere. And then, and then that makes heading somewhere really fun. Cause it's like, Oh, this isn't like a necessity. This is an adventure. And, uh, I think for me, that's been really cool and it might sound cliche and dumb, but, um, but I've noticed a visible shift that's happened in my life for over quite a few years. Um, but I feel like really finalized um, with me leaving uh, my position as an art director um, uh, that I had hung so many things around, um, you know, and it's uh, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to see with that taken away, my identity is better. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. I think I'm a better person. Um, and that's weird, you know, but, um, but I'm a much happier person. So that's, it's very strange to, um, have that realization. Cause like, again, a lot of the time, you know, we work, we work, we work, we're seeing progress. We're kind of like, you know, leveling up, leveling up, leveling up. And it's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to beat the game. Um, but I, I feel like in a weird way, I like leveled down and I'm like, Oh wow. Okay. This is part of the game. Like, I, I don't think I don't think there is a boss level that uh, that I'm going to reach. Like, sure, I'll go fight some bosses and stuff, but it's more fun just doing it for the fun of it. Realizing like there is no end to the bosses you fight in this game called life. <laughs> You're going to be like, you know, it's endless boss levels. Um, and uh and so, yeah, if you're just like, oh, man, I got to level up so I can fight the boss and level up so I can fight. It's just like pretty boring video game you know um whereas i think if you just enjoy the game for what it is it's like i don't know it's just so much better um so anyhow that's been really interesting to me uh that shift has been really fascinating um what else oh and then there's this thing about determinism that's been interesting to me and i've kind of touched on this a little bit but i want to kind of think through it or like i actually explain why i find it compelling so one of the biggest arguments that I've heard, and again, nothing I'm going to say is profound. I'm not a philosophy major, you know, so if you guys know more about this, I'd love to hear from you about it. Um, you know, understand I'm just like an art dude who, you know, does armchair other stuff, you know. Um, but from what I understand, it's like, um, so the argument, like, so determinism is the idea that like everything is kind of like, and this is hard determinism that I'm going to kind of, explain because I, I feel like from what i've looked at soft determinism um doesn't work <laughs> like it just collapses so hard determinism is what i'm going to talk about um hard determinism is like the idea that um everything you do every choice you make every breath um you take every move you make <laughs> i'm just i'm just gonna quote, quote the police no um it, it's the idea that you have everything that happens is just going to happen. There's no alternate option. Like you might feel like there's options. Um, you might feel like you have a choice, but at the end of the day, if you went back in time and replayed this scenario of life, you would have made the exact right turn or random choice that you made the first time. You would never make an, a different choice. Um, because there is no free will. That is hard determinism. It's the idea that there is no free will. Everything's predetermined. It's very doomer. It's a little scary, but that's that's the gist of it. Um, 
in opposition to this is the idea of like libertarianism where it's like it and not libertarianism like the um <clears throat> like libertarians you know politically um although there's some some correspondence philosophically it's the idea that like we're free we have liberty we have uh, freedom of choice um and so uh while there are some uh, there's no one in the right mind um who doesn't agree that there are some fixed determined things um and we'll get into that because that has a lot to do with why it's hard to justify that there aren't all fixed things if there's anything that's fixed when it comes to um anyhow we'll get into that so the the gist of it um let's see here oh we finished a panel so let's take a break real quick and uh we'll get back to this in a second so i'm gonna play let's do this i'm gonna get some uh some water and then we will continue coloring this panel and continue uh the conversation about determinism which hopefully is interesting to you guys i don't know we'll see um here is the trailer for uh let's see Let's play. Uh, let's play. Kids say, Kemble. And I want to also preface this with: this trailer is made by Jim Lujan, whose uh, new trailer for the Full Fungus is on his channel, which you guys should watch. It it looks like uh, it's Jim's magnum opus. Everything he makes is always like a million times better than the last thing he made, and everything he made last was good. So it just gets better and better. Um, his direction, his writing, his art, his uh, everything. But this, I think, is going to be his best thing. Um, and you guys should check it out. So it's the full fungus. But if you want a sample of what Jim's stuff is like, uh, here is the trailer he did uh, for me. Here it is. And I'll be right back. You know, the Georgia kids say the craziest thing. So, little Susie, do you have any brothers or sisters? I understand you're in third grade. How do you like that? Do you like your teacher? You like to do a lot of fun things at school? You got any hobbies, Susie? Any, any things you like to do when you're not in school? I hear you like to read. Well, right now I'm reading two stories written and illustrated by Joshua Kemble. It grapples with faith and mental illness. It's ultimately a story about redemption. It's a savage piece of writing. Also, I just finished up Jacob's Apartment, another one by Campbell. Jacob's Apartment weaves together elements of spiritualism and relationship dynamics, as well as atheism. And all the while, it deals with abandonment and loyalty. It's, it's a fierce, fierce read. Do you like ponies? Okay, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue. We're gonna color to the next page, and then I'm gonna ramble about uh, determinism versus free will. <laughs> uh, so the the whole idea of like pure libertarianism or free will, um, and philosophically, just in the sense of like fate. Uh, these are like theories of the fates. Uh, they've existed forever, you know, since like the the early since man started questioning purpose and identity and meaning and, and these heavy questions. Um, this has been like a debate for years, like where it's like, do you really have a choice when you make a choice? Um, and so uh, the biggest arguments for it, from what I understand for free will are the fact that we feel like we make a choice. It's just like when somebody says you have no freedom and no choice, and even the choices you made, are all preset and pre-written and you kind of can't deviate from the path. You're a piece of music fed into an automatic piano, you know, like a sheet reading piano that's just playing your notes. And those notes, like no matter how many times you feed it in, are going to play the exact same note, no matter how much that note feels like it's a, a choice. Like it, it, it feels like it's choosing that note but it's not, it's pre-written. And that, th so, so, okay. So that everything about that just 
like messes with our intuition. And I think that's the biggest um, reason people think that things are not predetermined because if everything's predetermined, what if I choose to wear like a purple polka dotted shirt today just to show that things are not predetermined? Ha ha. See, randomness. It, it allows me to just kind of make a choice like. um, OK, so that that's I, I know there's more solid cases for it, but I think the idea is like, um, especially when it comes to things like morality and law and things like that these things depend quite heavily on the idea of uh you having a free choice like no matter what circumstances you always have a choice which i philosophically kind of agree with even though i don't know if it's true <laughs> so again like you know i um it's a weird thing to kind of get into but it's but it's fun and and i've been uh reading about it and listening to stuff on it for a little bit now so okay here's the thing even the most hardcore you know person about like free will and free choice will posit or at least if they're a, a decent person coming in good faith will admit that there are things within this world that are outside of your control that are kind of forces of fate or sort of predestined things to happen, whether you believe in like a supernatural writing of it or just an order of events that was going to lead to that storm that hit the, uh, that hit the water, you know, and, and it was all the culminating events before, right. Um, that, that caused that effect, right. What's up? My what? Oh, <laughs> my wife said your Jeff Goldblum is showing. That's I'll take that as a compliment. Jeff Goldblum is awesome. Um, so so like here's here's the thing. Like so, in order to believe in the scientific process at all, and I think even people who are like science skeptics at least generally believe in the idea of cause and effect, like the law of cause and effect or inertia, right? Where it's like every, every action will have an equal or opposite reaction, right? So generally, when you look at something, there was a cause, like there's a causal case for everything observable in the universe. Like if you see um, a boulder rolling down a hill, generally, it's not just, just that the boulder just randomly appeared and rolled down the hill. There was a cause, like there was a reason that it happened prior and it was, and it was generally a causal thing and it was probably an action creating a reaction. Right. Um, and so if we posit that, right, we admit that there are some things that are deterministic, like whether you're a hard determinist or a part determinist, I think everyone at some point is a determinist, right? Where you are admitting that there are things in life that are caused, that are kind of because of prior things that occurred, those things will just play out exactly as they played out. Um, and, and we can definitely see that with things like, you know, uh, weather and things like that. And there are things that can impact that um, future uh, thing. But like in the present, there are things, at least in your life, that are determined. And then there are things that you feel are your choice, right? So um, it's the uh, the old uh, Gandalf thing, right? Like Gandalf has that same, it's one of my favorite quotes actually. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna botch it. And we have it on our wall actually, cause I love it. But it's basically, you don't get to choose the time that you're given or what's given to you. You get, all you can choose is how, to, like what to do with basically what you're given um, or, or I, I'm botching it. But the, the, gist, the gist is um, you don't get to choose the time you're put into. You don't get to choose um, the burdens that are placed on you. But you do get to choose um, what you do with those things, right? Like, you know, uh, if I'm born uh, with no legs, um, I don't get to choose to have legs. I, I, I don't just get to go, nope, I, <laughs> I actually have legs. And then it goes, oh, you do. 
Uh, maybe I just dedicate my life to science and invent cool, you know, robotic legs or something and then make that change. But, but the point is I don't get to just change what I was given um, before I even had a choice in, in what was given to me. Right. This is where it gets really interesting. But when we choose something, it, it's a choice, right? And it's free will. I think that's the big argument. And and that's generally been where I've been at for like most of my life is the idea of like, I'm I, there's some things where I'm completely deterministic about, but we definitely have a choice, right? We definitely have free will. Uh, and like if I choose to go left on the freeway and it, like if it's a causal reason, right? Like if there's a semi truck, coming in the uh, opposite lane and, 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 and the getting in the left lane is the only thing that'll allow me to survive. Then, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a predetermined thing slightly, right? Because my instinct of survival is just going to drive that decision to go left. Like it's not going to be so much a free will thing as like a crap, I need to survive and, you know, autopilot to survival choices. Um, So that's more of like a determined, but, but in, in the past, I've always thought, but there's that other kind of thing, right? Um, and let me know if this is making sense or if it's boring. Um, <laughs> and again, I, I, I know there's probably like logical holes in my argument because, again, I'm not like a philosophy major. I took some philosophy classes, but like, dude, I, that was years ago, like over 20 years ago now. So <laughs> like, what do I know? Um but anyhow, so I, I had always viewed it as like, but, you know, if um, if like it's a clear day and the road's wide open and I'm just on a long road trip and driving my car and I decide, you know what, I think I'll just make a left. Um, that's a random choice, right? Expressing my free will and independence. Um, here's the thing, though. Is it? <laughs> is it a free will choice? Because the, the, there's a lot of things you want to ask. Why do we make choices? And this is really interesting to me. And by the way, I'm borrowing this from a lot of um, determinists that, you know, I've listened to and, and read some stuff by that I've been slightly convinced by. So I'm like paraphrasing a lot of arguments. And I'm not as familiar with this because it's, again, something I'm exploring right now. So I'm not even able to, like, quote who these you know, people are because <laughs> there's just a, an amalgam of different people that I've been reading um, and listening to. Um, and then obviously I'll deeper dive if I get more or less convinced. But anyhow, so here's the thing. Why do we make choices, right? Like why, when you're on that freeway in the open road, would you, you know, choose to make a left turn, right? Um, it, it why, what is going to drive you to make a choice? Like, why do human beings choose any choice? Um, and that's going to be answered by generally, it's going to be like either instinctual, which, like I said, is like hardly free will, right? Like if it's just a survival choice and it, you go into autopilot, that's not necessarily a choice, right? Like if um, somebody swings at me and I haven't trained as a fighter or something, somebody swings a punch at me and I block it. I don't know if that's so much a choice as just like an instinct. And even if you've trained as a fighter, you know, like that might just be like an instinctual response, you know, of like self-protection. So I think things that are like driven by like self-protection or even maybe like seeking food for like hunger. Right. I don't know if these are so much free will kind of decisions, like at least in my mind. I separate those from other decisions that I used to associate with free will, right? Where it's like, so yeah, like I, I can kind of choose to eat and we can get into maybe like type of food as a potential um, choice that's free will. All right, Jim Lujan said, uh, Scott, Paul, hello. How's it going, Jim? Uh, Jim had a great, hey man, how's your movie going the other day? Um, you guys should check it out on Jim's channel after you watch the trailer for the full fun guy. Um, I think you need to make a sequel that's just the full fun guy, but it's not fungus like fun guy. It's fun guy like he's a fun guy. Um, I, I'm here all night, folks. I'm here all night. Anyhow, so um, anyhow, like so continuing this like free will idea. So I think we can rule out at least 
the desire for food or the desire for, um, you know, like for, for things that fit those like base level needs that any biological creature is going to have, you know, um, I don't think those are so much a choice as just a survival instinct, right? Like as, as an instinct to survive, I'm going to protect myself. Um, I'm going to fight to protect myself or run to protect myself, fight or flight, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's not so much a choice. Now, how I do it, you could argue maybe is a choice, but I think a lot of us would argue, uh, would agree like, you know, that stuff is more kind of predetermined. Like it's just kind of baked in the cake. It's in your genes. It's in your immuno response. It's in your, like, you know, um, your brain neurons just kind of firing, uh, especially in the fight or flight moment. And there's not going to be a ton of like rationalization or like personal thought at the basis of those choices. So we can rule those out as not free will, or at least questionably free will. Right. Uh, Jim said, well, you will be the star of next Hey Man. Yes, 100%, dude. I'm down. Um, I'll be your star, Jim. I'll be your star in the night sky. Um, I'll be your supernova flashing through the boiling universe. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to, trying to go somewhere with that. Anyhow, so like, so... The thing that's interesting to me about the determinism argument is there's there's a lot of choices we make that you could say are pre predetermined. And I don't think even the most hardcore person who like advocates for libertarian freedom. And by that, I do not mean libertarian, the political party um, or the Ayn Randian you know, view of things. Um I just mean libertarian in the idea of you are born with liberty, right? You have freedom, you have choice. Um, regardless of how limited the choice, you have choice. Um, so then we can start getting into some things that get really interesting. Um, Jim said, have you written any songs on the Firefly yet? If not, what type of songs are you going to write with it? The F Firefly, I think, is a rock machine. I think that thing is a rock machine or it's going to be jazzy stuff. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's got a humbucking vibe. It's a, they're really hot pickups. Um, I don't know about yours, Jim, but like the pickups are super hot. So they like, they want to crunch a little bit, even on clean. So I think what I'd go for is like really those things where I need that like raw tone, um, that feels really open and clangy but it's not going to be like clear and crisp like a Telecaster. Um, and it may not have quite the warmth of the Les Paul. It's got like a warm, but kind of crunchy um, uh, vibe to it. But man, I got to say, Jim, that Firefly uh, is when I get to that, I, I've gotten through guitar number 10. Um, but when I get to that number, I cannot wait to get into the specs on that Firefly. That guitar makes me doubt a lot of decisions I've made on guitars. <laughs> it's like, it is so good for the price. I, I am, I am really floored by that guitar. Um, especially the setup and playability of it. Like the neck is like perfect on it. The action is perfect. The intonation, um, it just feels like a really expensive guitar. And the fact that it's like, under a couple hundred bucks is like, I, I, yeah, I don't know, Jim, but I'm glad that I had read about these for years and I'm so glad that you were the first of our friend group. I told Kevin about them too. So you never know, maybe Kevin will pick one up too. Cause I guess he's been seeing reviews and stuff of the same thing on a lot of guitar channels. And, but it's been kind of on the fence about it. Um, and it's like, I feel like, you broke the barricade in our friend group to see if that was true or not. You were like our test. Um, you were the test, uh, the test pilot. And so, um, yeah, I, I can't wait to find a use for it, but there's definitely a use for it because it has its own tone. Um, I really like, I was surprised because generally on like a Les Paul 
or uh, an SG, which are like the two humbucker things, you know, it's like, so they're in a similar school. I tend to like like the neck or the, uh, the bridge pickup. And then the middle pickup where you're using all the, like both, it, it just never is like that great, you know? Um, it, but what's surprising to me about the Firefly is I, I think my favorite position on it um, is mid position where it's got the both pickups going. It's just really balanced and pretty. Um, I, I was surprised. I'm just very surprised by that thing. But it definitely is going to be like a rock machine. I'm curious what you are going to be using or what you have used the 335 on. I could see it working really well for like a Sergio Leone kind of vibe. Um, and it's definitely like on a clean, it's it, again, it's really pretty. But it has like a, a um, it has a desire for a little bit of overload, like it's a little hot. And I love that. Um, so yeah, I, I like that about it. So anyhow, we were, okay, let me get back to the determinism thing. Where were we on this path? Okay. Um, oh, he was saying great for soundtrack, great for writing old school country or rock. Also great for strumming. Yes. I agree with that too. Um, yeah, country rock, uh, country would be great on that. Again, it just has, um, yeah, it's just, it's a, just a great, great guitar and i will say just the feel of that guitar is one of my favorite um feeling guitars i was really surprised again like just for that budget to have that kind of level of setup on a guitar is just unbelievable like you know i'm reminded of the cheap guitars jim you and i used to have to deal with you know like growing up and it's like man they've just gotten so much better um for like way less like compared <laughs> like I'm I'm comparing that Firefly to like the crappy Synsonics Sears catalog ordered guitar that I started on. And it, it you know, which was like plywood with a couple strings like nailed to it, <laughs> you know, and uh, and comparing that to like a guitar where when I pick it up, it feels like pretty close to a Gibson. Like it's not qu it's not exactly a Gibson, but it feels pretty darn close. Like the the quality of the setup is unbelievable for that price um so now i'm curious about like their strats and their other guitars because i'm like man at that price like if the guitars are that good i mean i may never buy like a name brand guitar again <laughs> i might just be sticking to firefly till i get a lemon and then i'd be like okay maybe maybe i do need the name brand but yeah it's a pretty it's a pretty killer little guitar and it feels great. You're right for strumming and it has um, a really good intonation to it or not intonation uh, sustain. Like it, it's a very, uh, that's the word resonant. It's like a resonant guitar. Um, uh, I need to erase that line because it wouldn't happen that soon. Um, so let's erase this line real quick and then get back on the determinism bandwagon so so here's the thing so we've already acknowledged at least you know and, and by the way if you guys disagree or have thoughts on this like definitely let me know in the chats um but like i think most of us would agree at this point in the conversation hopefully that like yeah there's some choices that we can acknowledge are not necessarily choice like they may feel like choices but a lot of them are just instinctual reactions um and then we also know that there are some choices you know, that while you feel like you're making a choice because of the circumstances that were thrown at you, like a semi truck coming your way on the freeway or whatever it is, it caused a reaction. Like there was a causal thing where, where the, the free will in the, in the, in the moment is, is a little questionable. Even if it felt like a free choice at the time, it may not necessarily be free. And I think a lot of us could at that point with those kind of choices admit it's a little wiggly. But where it starts getting really interesting is when, again, when you start thinking about why you make choices. So those choices that are just straight instinct, reaction, response, like fight or flight, it's hard to make the case that those are fully choice-based, if even at all, choice-based um, reactions. Um, 
So then we start getting into like the more fine point reactions like, um, but I want a purple shirt today with polka dots because, I, you know, I want to just make a choice that's a different choice. And uh, it's a choice I never would have made, except that I'm, I'm picking a random choice. Well, we start thinking like, why do we make choices in, all, all together? Like, why do I make choice? Why would I make a choice to wear a purple polka dot shirt? Why would I make a choice to eat a uh, chorizo breakfast burrito, my favorite food on the planet, which I can't eat as often. Jim, I don't know if this happened to you, but as I'm getting older, I pay for those chorizo burritos, man. I pay for them for weeks. Well, for a, about a week, but I still, I'll still eat them every once in a while, but man, it's, it's a, there's a cost to those, <laughs> to those foods. I love <laughs> there's a cost that didn't exist when I was a young man that now exists where it's like, okay, this is a transaction I'm willing to make. I can risk a week of my stomach feeling weird. Anyhow. Um, okay. So those choices though, like if I choose, I'm going to eat a chorizo breakfast burrito over, like I'm at a restaurant and there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the menu. Well, why do you choose anything you choose? Generally, it's going to be like instinctual, like we said, like, you know, re reaction. Um, <laughs> Jim said chorizo is the new heroin. It really is kind of like that. Yeah, because I'll I'll binge every once in a while because I'm like, but it's like, man, I got to. I to prepare for a time I might have to call out from work, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I just now I'm imagining like some um, some uh, like opium den kind of scenario where you go to like the seedy like restaurant where there's guys like, you know, it's it's like the scene in like that Sherlock Holmes where, where he goes into like the opium den and there's just like all these opium addicts on different beds like in the area and they're just all losing their minds it's like that but it's just a guy serving chorizo breakfast burritos <laughs> and there's guys on the bed like uh just uh just give me another one man it's like you've had enough give me more i need more chorizo um we need to make this happen that's your next uh that's your next movie jim is the chorizo dealer it's like the wife talking to her husband saying like, honey, you got to just, can you just, just do a sausage breakfast burrito this time? It's like, no, I need that chorizo, man. You either need chorizo or you need me. I'll take chorizo. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, okay. So, so the free will thing gets interesting when we start thinking about why we choose things, because I think in general is because there's a desire for that thing. So a good example would be like, I feel like, um, and this is why it like, it, it's so hard to want to believe in determinism because I feel like in my life, I have made the choice to exercise very hardly. Like I, I didn't grow up around people who exercised. I never have been a person who exercised. And I threw hard work and determination have become a person who exercises and does it consistently, even though it goes against what I want to do half the time. It's like self-discipline, which is one of the things all of us like to believe in if we believe in free will. But then I start thinking, well, why do I have that self-discipline? And it's like, well, I have that self-discipline because at the end of the day, I want to be healthier and I want to have more energy and um, so that I can like live longer uh, to be a dad to my kid a little longer than I would otherwise. Um, so I can feel better and so that I can function better. So I'm better at work. And so it's like there's a functional reason that I want to have self-control. And so while I feel like I'm choosing to exercise. And I feel like I'm not exercising because I want to. I am exercising because I want to. And maybe I don't want to exercise, but I want to exercise in order to get those other things. So at the end of the day, even doing something that I don't want to do for a longer term goal, right, is kind of doing something you want to do because you want to make the choice you don't want to do in order to get the thing you want that comes from making the choice you didn't want to do. It's a weird thought. 
My point being, you don't make choices you don't want. Um, you can feel like you're making a choice you don't want, but usually that's in service to a greater want or a greater desire, right? You're usually making choices based on long-term or short-term benefits, or again, just on instinct. So this is really interesting. If we're just making choices on what we want or what we want to do, that's the thing. Like, you know, when you're faced with a choice, what do you want to do? Um, do you choose what you want to do? And that gets really interesting. <laughs> because let's say, you know, I'm a person who has a proclivity to like dark flavored things. Like in my genetics, maybe. I don't know. But in my genetics, maybe my taste palate is more responsive to things like coffee, black coffee. And so because of that, when I was younger and tried a cigarette, I enjoyed it. Whereas a lot of, I know a lot of people who tried a cigarette when they were the same age as me and were like, this is gross, you know? And there's even a meme about it where like parents used to have this thing where they'd be like, oh, you caught you smoking. Now you're going to smoke this whole pack in front of me. And the kid gets sick and is like, oh, this is disgusting and never smokes again. I didn't have that. The first time I tried a cigarette, I loved it. I didn't, it wasn't gross. It didn't take time to acquire a, a taste to it. I just enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Um, if somebody after that had given me a carton, I would have probably burnt through it and been like, that was awesome. At, at that age, I just, I really liked it. It didn't take a time to like acquire a taste for it. It's just something I liked. Now, is it, did I choose being the person who would like that instantly? Now, I know there's things in it that make you addicted to it later on, which are unfortunate, and I wish I hadn't liked it, and I wish I hadn't tried it. But my point is, did I choose to be the type of person that would just without even needing to get acclimated to it or like try it or try to like it because it looked cool. It's like, no, the first time I had it, I just like the first drag. I was like, this is awesome. It tastes great. Um, how is that? Right. When like most people, you know, a lot of people do that and either they keep it going because they're just trying to be cool or they kind of like, like the feeling they get from it, but they don't like the flavor how, how did I just end up being a person who really liked that flavor? Did I pick that? Did I pick pick to do that? Um, how did I end up being a person who would pick a polka dot shirt randomly to try to prove that I have free will? Well, I'd have to be like a weirdo who's thinking about free will, right? <laughs> right? Like, because a lot of people out there not by choice, just have no interest in like philosophy. Like they'll take a philosophy class. They're just like, man, this sucks. Or they just haven't had the luck or the fortune to be in a scenario where they could take a philosophy class or take any interest in it or even care. Like maybe somebody could comprehend it, but they're just like, yeah, this is stupid. Why would I even think about this? Do I choose to be the type of person who like ruminate on such a weird topic that like, there's no reason for me to ruminate on. It's just interesting. And then that's interesting. Why is it interesting? Can I choose? Can I force to make something interesting that's not interesting to me? And it starts making me doubt for myself and for other people. Just that line of thought like starts to make me, me erode a little bit and go, okay, so... I at least have to give determinists the idea that there are definitely factors influencing my decisions that are not of my own free will, even when those decisions are my free will. Like they still feel like my free will, but I have to admit they're guided by external forces a little bit, right? Right. There is definitely a cause to the effect of me wanting something, right? If I wanted something, it's got to be caused by something, right? The, the rule of causation. 
is this at all interesting? <laughs> oh, by the way, um, <laughs> Teresa Pume Den. <laughs> Teresa Pium Den. <laughs> It's Chirinopium. Oh my gosh, Jim, you've just dis figured out how to like ruin the, the universe. If you could somehow create chorizo that has opium in it, everyone on the planet would get it and just become opium addicts. Right? It's just, too, it's too good to turn down. Um, Because it's like, this is opium. Well, I'm not really that interested in opium. It has chorizo. All right, I'm sold. <laughs> that's how that's how um, famine happens in the apocalypse. Somebody invents chorizo opium. Really <laughs> My said I'm making her really hungry. Yeah. Now all I want is like a breakfast burrito. <laughs> I think we should get breakfast burritos for dinner. I'm willing to pay the cost, Mai, are you? So, yeah, you know, like, it's interesting to me. I, I mean, I don't want to kind of keep going because it, it goes further, right? Where, like, the more you kind of chip away at the things that feel like free will, you know, and you start thinking about, like, um, what goes into, like, an analysis of why somebody did something? Like, what do you want to know if you watch... Um, if you watch a documentary about a horrible person, right, who did despicable things, what's the first thing you want to know? Right. If you read a news article about like a horrible event that was caused by a person, you know, um, what's the first thing you want to know? And usually it's why, right? It's why. What was the cause? Why would somebody choose to do something so horrible? Right. What was the cause? And then when they start making these documentaries or an investigative journalist covers an event like that and they start going into it and start answering the why, what do they start getting into? Environment, family life, right? Genetics, things that you don't have a ton of choice over. You don't get to choose where you're born. You don't get to choose who you're born to. You don't get to choose what proclivities you're born with genetically. You know, like you don't get to choose whether you're born with a defect or without. Um, and, 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 you know, the more they study uh, the brain, the more that like a bunch of things that people thought were choices aren't choices. It, like, you know, um, you know, they start discovering things like where they thought like maybe kids were choosing to be really antisocial or something like that. And then they find out, no, no, no. Like there's this whole spectrum of autism. Right. And it's it's genetic. And there's some parts of it that can be environmental, but it's definitely genetic. So it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. Right. Um, there's all sorts of things you don't get to choose. Right. And the one thing that's really hard is, can you choose what you want? Can I like force myself? Like if I really want a chorizo breakfast burrito and there's something I have no interest in that's completely boring that I don't even want to read the name on the menu because I'm so interested in the chorizo breakfast burrito. Can I force myself to suddenly have a desire to look at at a different spot on the menu if I'm have no desire to do that. Like without the desire, right? It, it's just, it's impossible. And then it starts making me wonder how many of those choices are just driven by a desire that happened because of environment and because of um, nature more than nurture, right? And, and this gets really interesting because, um, and this is really fascinating, but anybody, like I, I've heard this uh, stated before and I agree with it. It's anybody who agrees in just pure nurture versus nature as a parent, meaning like the environment um, has not, like, 
the environment has everything to do like the environment and the rules and, and the rearing of a kid have everything to do with how a kid turns out have just never have kids um, because anyone I know is a parent. It's like there are things about a kid that before they even have rules or anything like that, they have a little personality and it's it's like really unique. And there are things where you're like, oh, you got that from your mom or oh, you got that from your dad. Um, and definitely like visually, almost all of it's like, oh, that came from, you know, your grandpa or that came from like you can kind of piece together the genes that are forming in this little being. But there's also a unique thing about each kid and they all have proclivities to different um, personalities, different interests, different desires. And this is before they've been nurtured at all. And as they're nurtured, like you can have two kids, but like almost similar, like totally similar environments. Right. And they're just totally different. Um, one will be more ambitious and wild and one will be more safe and cautious. And it's just like, they don't really choose that. That's just what they are like from birth. And it's kind of interesting. So I'm stretching that a little further and going, I start questioning Personally, I have started questioning how much any choice, like even the random choice that, you know, if I choose to scratch my nose now, it didn't itch. I just chose that out of randomness. Everything in my environment, I think, actually made me do that, which is bizarre. So I don't think that takes away accountability for being a terrible person. I don't think you can run a society without accountability. Um, to account for it, but it makes me less judgmental because I start realizing I don't know. I, I, I am becoming more and more convinced. And again, I'm not a hundred percent convinced on this. There's things in my life that I am like fully convinced of. This is not one of them. This is something I'm being compelled by a little bit. It's a very fascinating and hard to disprove thing. And that makes it really interesting to me because it's a very, um, it's just, it's just the logic, at least to me, seems really sound. Um, as much as my feelings don't like that the logic is sound, which to me indicates that it, it might be true. <laughs> like my feelings have rarely ever, um, led me to truth. Like I, it, it's, it's usually, um, rationality that maybe feelings have guided me somewhere where I've stumbled on, on truth. Um, but yeah, so like my innate feeling is that we have free will. But the more I read about it, the more I think about it, the more I try to just dissect what is free will, like what is controlled by environment and things around us, the more I start getting convinced that like for reasons that I kind of walk through with just like some basic stuff, we haven't even gone super deep on it. Um, that's why I've been finding determinism really fascinating. Because I think it's harder, it's actually pretty hard to make a, cha a, a, a case on uh, that we really get to make a choice in anything at all. Um, and, and a lot of that's ruled by cause and effect. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting. So philosophically, like that's all got all kinds of problems <laughs> and implications that a, a lot of which I totally don't like. Right. Because I think innately as human beings, we really want freedom like we want freedom. Um, it's something that especially for an American like myself, it's like, dude, I want freedom. I want I want to know that I steer this ship that I'm on. Um, but I'm becoming less and less convinced of it, even as much as I feel it like I feel like I'm steering my ship. I can't choose to not feel like I'm steering my ship. I, I am steering this ship in my head. I, no matter how logical it may seem that I'm not, it, it just feels that way. I can't change that. But I do like rationally start thinking there might be truth to the fact that like, we're not really making any choices at all that we're, we're literally notes just playing. Um, being played on cheap music. Like we're, we're not, um, uh, even a, a random note that might seem random, you know, in a, <laughs> if it's being 
fed to like one of those uh, automatic pianos, you know, that has the little rolled sheet music. There might be a note or two that sounds spontaneous. Um, but yeah, it's all pre-written and uh, it's all set. It's like, it's not going to change. Um, and if you replayed it, it wouldn't change. Uh, and that's interesting to me. How we can even think and replay and go, hmm, maybe that would have changed. But I don't think, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if we're in a world of like back to the future where you can go back in the past and fix a uh, a thing that affects the future. I kind of think that if you went back in the past, the, fu- the past would be fixed. Um, and therefore the future would be fixed as well. Um, that's what I'm starting to think. So it's really interesting. Um, and I like, again, by no means am I an expert on this. It's just really fascinating to me. I'd love to hear, um, what you guys think about that. Adam said, Hey guys, watching while, uh, while riding the bus, Frank said a fixed point in time. Um, I think every point in time is fixed. Um, that's what I'm starting to think, which is a little scary. So I think in time future, in time past and in present, I think everything is fixed. Um, I'm starting to think that, which is weird. And I know it creates a whole conundrum of things, but I think, I think it has to be, it, I'm starting to think that it has to be true. But again, I need to read more on it before I can outright say, that I'm fully convinced. So I was a little concerned about this initially because I was like, again, like whenever I explore an idea, it's like truth can't negate truth. And it's like, what would this do for like my faith? Right. Because I mean, my faith hinges on the idea of there being a choice. Right. And, um, and then I like the more I've read about determinism, the more I've realized that there's a long history with um, theology and determinism and a lot of early theologians dating back to like the foundation of the church uh, were deterministic Um, full. And I don't mean like soft determinists. Like I mean like hard determinists, um, which is kind of what I'm describing. Like a soft determinist is like, I think everybody's a soft determinist to be honest, even if you say you're not, because I think, um, you know, everyone will acknowledge there are things right. That are not choice. Like they just kind of happen. There are, causes that just kind of create effects that you have no choice over either the cause or the effect. Um, and I think that all people have no choice over, um, uh, but it's, but it's interesting. So that's something I'm going to have to read more deeply on because I do think that would create a potential problem, but it's really interesting to me that it has an overlap. Um, and, and not an overlap that I, chose to be interested in this because of it's like i i actually got interested in this uh from some of the philosophy stuff i'll, I'll follow or read and then uh and then from there it just kind of branched out to like wow what an interesting thing and i've just been listening to more and more of it uh jim was saying uh don't let the bus go under 50 miles per hour or it'll explode oh no it's speed you know what? I would love to rewatch that movie. I wonder if it holds up. That was a pretty cool movie from what I recall. But it might be like horrible now. I don't know. But I remember it was pretty, pretty amazing. What do you do? What do you do? I thought that was a part in it where Keanu Reeves was like, you've got whatever with five seconds to spare. What do you do? What do you do? Um, all right. Does anyone need banning? I'll switch to my wrenched account. No, you're, you're good, Frank. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm going to... I've finished another panel. So we got three left. Three of these beasts left. So we're going to play another trailer. So we might be going like one more hour. And then by then, I'm like, even if I'm not done, I have to go help clean the fish tank. Cause we have two giant fish tanks that need cleaning. Um, but anyhow, so we'll go for another hour minimum. And, uh, here is the trailer. Let's keep it on a Luhan vibe. Let's do word Zoid. Uh, since Jim has, again, I want to 
mention he has a trailer for the full fungus on his channel, Jim Luhan. So if you like this little trailer and some of the humor in it, uh, this is a, a, a tiny fraction, a, a small speck um, of what Jim's uh, stuff on his site is like. It's so good. Uh, so you guys should check out the full fungus. But here's the, a very, here's a little sample taste for you. Well, Peter, since I'm such a big music fan, I'm going to have to go with Karen Carpenter. Oh, Stu, I'm sorry. That's the incorrect answer. Trish, what you got for us? I'm going to go with Kim Gordon. All right, let's check that answer. Kim Gordon, do we have a Kim Gordon? Yes, and that means you're our new word zoid champion, Trish. Dale, tell Trish what she's won. Trish, you've won a copy of Two Stories, a memoir of faith and mental illness. Handwritten, hand-drawn, and handed to you by artist and writer Joshua Campbell. But wait, that's not all. You've also won a copy of Jacob's Apartment, the story of a doomed romance. What happens when you take eternal sunshine out of the spotless mind and put it in a blender with Ghost World? You get Jacob's Apartment, written and illustrated by Joshua Kremble. Trish, thank you for playing Wordzoid. All right, great job, Trish. Um, I was told I was going to get a lifetime supply of paper towels. All right. We're back. We delved into some deep meaning I felt the other day uh, whilst sitting on a swing in my backyard and we we got into hard determinism. We uh, we showed a awesome Les Paul. Um, and meanwhile, you know, you know what I think, though, if, if I were Paul Pate, I wouldn't want a less Paul. I'd want a more Paul. That's right. That's right. A Gibson Moore Paul. That'll be Paul Pate's signature guitar. Is a Gibson Moore Paul. He can just buy a Les Paul and cross out the less and write more. That's right. And it'll be the most rock and roll thing ever. It's it's like as cool as having your amp turn to 11. Because... It's like saying, you've got a less Paul. I've got more Paul. Anyhow, um, Frank said, have you seen the fish tanks that have a cubby hole for cats to lay in? No, I don't. I know that we got a little thing for one of our fish tanks that has like a little underground fortress. So it's like a little uh, false floor that you can put rocks over and then you can see this secret hideaway. And the fish like to go in it. We have a um, we have a fish named Sean Connery. He was a uh, he's a um, like a catfish type fish. He's like a little algae eater, and he uh, likes to like chill in this little secret hideout. And it's hilarious because you watch him go into the little tunnel, and like he's just hanging out there while the other fish, you know, just swim about, have no idea. And he's like one of those fish that's really camouflage. So like you can tell like he's really digging it. Like he 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 likes hiding. That's like his thing. So giving him a little hiding place. But a little spot for cats to hang out in an aquarium. That sounds like a torture device for for cats. Um, because I think cats like to kill fish like a lot. Um and so I, I, I just imagine that if you have cats with just fish, like their prey, just dancing in front of them, being like, you can't get me. I, I, I don't know. To me, that sounds like hell for a cat. I don't know. I don't own cats because I'm allergic to them. Uh, but from what I understand from roommates I've had with cats, that uh, that sounds funny for the owner, but definitely... Um, Cucumber level evil on that end. Uh, Paul said, hard determination to eat this pizza in front of me. Yeah, you don't have a choice, Paul. You will eat that pizza and you will watch more of this stream. It's just going to happen. There's no choice in the matter. You're just a slave to your um, 
your uh, your neurons firing. Isn't that a terrifying idea? I like that's the thing. As much as I'm compelled by it, and and the the logic holds up, it's still I I don't like it. Like that's the thing. I really don't like the implication of it, and it's it's very weird. I'm trying to think like why I don't like it, you know. And I wonder if it's that you know the moral implication, which is a little scary. Or if it's like a pride thing where it's like, but I like the fact that in my life, like there's places I've arrived that are results of choices that I've made, right? Like, you know, um, good things or bad things that have happened to me are results of choices that I've made. And and like, those are choices I made with my own agency. Uh, it's hard to think. Oh, nice. More or less, Paul, like Thurston Moore. Got it. Um, Frank said, hello, Paul, you've been ignoring my letters again. Oh no. Has Frank been sending you letters? Hello, Paul. <laughs> um, I just, when I read that, I'm like, wow, that's, that's epic. So I definitely got to finish these panels and I don't want to. I don't want to. I actually want to just go clean the fish tank. But we're going to get there. We're going to get through it, guys. Frank said my tasteful letters. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Honestly, Paul, you should sort from Frank's letters from his tasteful and his distasteful letters. Um, the, the tasteful ones, you definitely want to read the distasteful ones. You may not want to read. They, they might leave a bad taste in your mouth. Um, strawberry letter 23. <laughs> strawberry letter 23 is a great Beatles cover band. Um, I was really excited, uh, on seeing, um, the last, hey man, how's your movie going? Uh, where it was revealed that there there is some Beatles appearances on the full fungus. Some of the Beatles are on there, and uh, I I was a little I was a little pleased, a little pleased. It's quite refreshing. What was the what was the old joke? There there was a joke a long time ago. Where it was like I'm John, I'm Paul, and I'm Ringo, and I've got no. It's like and I'm I I can't even remember, but it, it ended it with like I'm Ringo, and I've got me finger stuck up me bum. <laughs> like it's so dumb. It's a joke that's existed forever. I don't know. Anyhow, um, let me know if you guys know the origin of that. one. I, I probably butchered that joke. That used to float around my, my group of friends. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. I will say this from like watching Beatles documentaries. I think that Ringo Starr was like, like the chillest beetle of all the Beatles. I think he seems like the one guy you'd really want to hang out with. Ringo looks like he'd be fun to party with. Like he just seems like a guy who had a good time. He enjoyed their success. Maybe he did a little bit of drugs, but he didn't get like wild with it. And like, he didn't have a lot of drama, like with ladies or anything like that. He played his parts he, he's not remembered as like a revolutionary drummer, even though I think he's a great drummer. So he did a good job, like an excellent job uh, in the band. And then he actually seems like the most likable guy in the band. <laughs> like, You know, and like my favorite Beatle has all, has pretty much always been like George Harrison. I think Harrison's just like for parts that the Beatles have done. Harrison was always my favorite. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd say for songwriting, I man, you know, 
as as cheesy as it is, I want to go all punk rock and be like, man, it was all Lennon. It's like, no, Paul, man, Paul was amazing. Lennon was amazing. But I but I but the older I get, the more I'm like, I don't know, like Paul seemed. You know, and this is if I were in the band, right? Paul seemed like really like the guy like pulling all the strings, especially towards the end, right? He was like, he's like the leader. Like he was like the guy who, and he very much felt like it. He was like, I could write all the parts. Like I am the guy, I'm the great. Um, And I feel like, you know, John was amazing, but he was like, you know, a philosopher took himself a little too seriously. And, uh, and, and honestly, again, like, seems like a cool guy, but like George seemed genius, but depressed, like, and self-doubting all the time. And then you got like Ringo, who's just like, Hey guys, let's party and rock and roll and play some music and record. And it's like, yeah, that's, that guy seems like the coolest. (laughs) I wouldn't have said this as a teenager by far. He would have been the most clowned on. But as I've gotten older, I'm like, that's the guy I'd want to hang with. I think just to like if I wanted to hang with somebody and ask them about their career and their genius and like get a taste of stuff like that, it would be Paul or or John or Ring or or or, um, or George. Right. Um, for sure. But it's like but if I just was like trying to have a good time out, you know, just like have a meal that I enjoy. I th- I really think Ringo is the like, he's just fun. Good, good on Ringo. Even his songs are just like, they're not great, but they're super fun. <laughs> nice. Uh, Paul said my favorite Beatle was Barry Gibb. Let's see. I always forget the name of the fifth Beatle. Who's the fifth Beatle that um uh that uh, there's there's a great movie too that now I'm forgetting um about the fifth Beatle. It was oh my gosh, so good too. I can't remember the name, but we used to watch it a lot. Uh, my old band used to watch rockumentaries all the time, and uh, like together, like we especially before a show. Like if we, if we were playing like a lame local show, we'd watch like one of those like VH one behind the music or like a long documentary or like the doors movie. And, oh, backbeat. That was it. Backbeat. It's a great movie. Um, it may not be. I, I liked it when I was in my teens and early twenties. I haven't really seen it since, but uh backbeat was really cool. It was like, about the fifth Beatle and then followed the Beatles in their like Liverpool era of like just being like a drunk kind of punk, uh, bar band, you know, like, um, it's really interesting. Uh, Oh, nice. I like that. Um, uh, Jim said my favorite Beatles are John, Paul, Simon, and Peter. My favorite Beatles are Paul Simon and um, Alvin Simon and Theodore. Those are my favorite Beatles for sure. Um, I also really thought Garfunkel was, was quite talented. Um, did I tell you guys about the troll shirt that I want to own? And I need somebody to buy it for me because there's no way in hell I'm going to buy it. But, but I would wear it. Um, it is a Nirvana t-shirt. That says Nirvana and it has a picture of Hanson. And it is one. of It's still to this day is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And I really want to wear it, but I don't want to buy it. (laughs) Does that make sense? Do you guys ever have something like that? That's like stupid funny. And you're like, I I would never pay for that, but I would totally rock it if (laughs) I don't know if you guys have that. I don't even know why I have that hang up. Like, why not just get it? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've had it on my Amazon wish list. Um, and I feel like I will one Christmas or one thing, like one day, someone will get me this very dumb t shirt and I will totally wear it. Ooh, I like Frank's uh, bit here. He said the backbeat boys. Back. Beats back, 
All right, in Liverpool. Yeah. We're making gold here. I don't I don't know why Jim, Paul, Frank. Why haven't Well, I guess Jim has been hired for writers rooms <laughs> in the past. I mean, technically Jim's done like like actual like Hollywood stuff. Um but for the rest of us, why haven't we all been in a writer's room? We should be hired as a crew to just come up with silly ideas and then have somebody else do them. I think that would be a really fun career. You know, I was talking about feeling all content and stuff like that in life. Um, maybe I'm not. Maybe that's maybe that's the level of content is when, you know, we got Frank, Jim, Paul and myself uh, being paid to be in a writer's room and just fart around. The ideal scenario, though, would be like we don't have to write it. We just kind of riff. And then there's maybe like a secretary, you know, in the room who's just like, I will combine all of these wild things into something. And we're like, thanks. <laughs> and we'd call our, uh, our writer's room like the what if boys or something, you know. Or you know what? Like, I'm not going to be biased. It could be the what if ladies, if you guys want, you know. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Frank said it would be a lot of jokes that only five of us would get. I know, but that would be so fun to get paid to do that. <laughs> It's like, we want to pay you to make indecipherable, weird humor riffs that play off of like both inside stuff, um, a lot that are just like the base level joke, um, and a lot of just weird, obscure kind of off kilter comedy that three people will laugh at. The what if pals, I like that. Mm hmm. I also feel like pal is a very underused word, you know? Okay, we're going to slam through these last two panels and we will be done by four o'clock. I thought we were going to be done by three, but such is comics, you know? I think animations like this, too. Because uh, I was watching that Hey Man, How's Your Movie going yesterday with uh, with the Lutes, with with Jimmy Lujan and. Uh, and Polly, Polly Pate and. Uh, Gar Hodges, I was realizing I was adding like a Y to everybody, so I'm like, I have to just delete the Y from Gary just to stay fair. Right. But anyhow, I, I, I watched that. Oh, and Chrissy Runciman. Um, I watched that and Jim was talking about his, you know, changing release dates where he was like, oh, initially I thought it would be this and then it became this. And then it's like I give like a soft estimate of this, but now I can roughly estimate I'll probably be done here. And I realized animation is like the same thing in that sense. Like you, you probably estimate it and you're like, yeah, you know, it'll be done by like December and then it's like January comes around. And you're like, eh, it'll be done by like February, you know, and like as much as you can give your best estimate, especially on personal projects or projects you're really like super invested in. It always ends up being a little bit like more time than than you kind of think. Um, and then sometimes it's like, oh, you're right on schedule. And then you come up with like a brilliant idea or a brilliant addition or you decide to like. I could have done this panel with like two people in the background, but it'd be really cool. Or this shot, you know, it'd be really cool to have like a giant crowd scene in this shot or something. Um, you know, you'll make like a decision like that. And then it's like, it extends it a lot more than originally estimated, you know, um, that's a hard one, you know, as I've gotten better at kind of roughly knowing, you know, my own time abilities, but I still make the mistake of kind of, under assuming when I think about, you know, well, how long is it going to take me to like flat this page? I can sit down and do this in a couple hours. And it's like three hours later. Honestly, this one might be right on right on budget, though. We'll see. So we're at, well, we're at the two hour mark, so it, it probably will be about 
three hours later. Okay. Um, but anyhow, uh, if you guys haven't, you should watch that. Also, we did art casters last night with, uh, with Kevin cross, good friend of the show, friend of friend of the friends. We're, we're all friends, but a friend of mine. And, uh, it was cool. He talked about animation and his kind of like rebranding on his YouTube channel and stuff. And it was fun to catch up with Kevin. Good to hear from him. Um, so that happened. And that was exciting. So you guys should check that out too. And right now, I am just deselecting the color of the drapes here. And what's great is when this is done, I can work on the uh, fish tank and then I have to revise. I do want to live stream while I do that, but I have to revise a uh, robotic turtle that I'm doing for a client. And uh, I just have to simplify the lines on it um, and then finalize it. So I will probably live stream while I do that. Um, which might be kind of fun. It's a client I've done a couple of book covers for, and they're great. Um, so I might work on that while I stream, maybe later tonight. So that'll be fun. Oh, you know what I was listening to? I, I want to know Jim's opinion on this, if Jim is still listening. Um, I was on a kick like listening to Velvet Underground uh, a couple days ago where I was like, yeah, you know, cycling through the playlist. And then um, Sweet Nothing came on. And I was like floored by how good that song is. Like, I was just like, man, that's a great song. <laughs> it's like it's one of the better songs I think ever written. And uh yeah, it was just it was just shocking. I was like, man, I, I had forgotten for like a year or two about that song. And then it was like a couple days ago. I was going down that, you know, Velvet Underground playlist, uh, you know, rabbit hole. I was like, how did I forget about Sweet Nothing? It's a great song. And, and honestly, like, that's a bar song. Like, <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense, but I feel like that is a song you put on if you're at like a dive. You know? All right. So we got. And they have a lot of great songs, but like that one. Man, I just like I was like, I because I never like a good example. They have the song heroin and it's like, I never forget that song. That song's great. It's classic. It's like if I think Velvet Underground, I think that song. Right. Or I think, you know, like rock and roll. Like there's a lot of songs where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like that's a great song. But that's one where I like, I don't know, I had kind of forgotten how good it is. <clears throat> Frank said uh, a friend asked him to do something really simple in Photoshop and he underestimated it as taking like five minutes. And then he's like, it took me like 50 minutes. Yeah, that uh, that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, I think there's about a 10 times rule where it's like, yeah, it'll probably take about 10 times generally. <laughs> Just multiply what I instantly think and uh, do it by 10. Yeah, Jim was saying all tomorrow's parties. Yeah, that's another one that like always comes to mind, you know, and I really like it's funny. A lot of people like who are like Velvet Underground fans actually don't like the Nico stuff as much. I really dig the Nico stuff. She's go cool to I, I feel like actually, <clears throat> to be honest, Jim. Am I off here? I feel like sometimes some of the fake explosion bands 
we'll have a female singer that sounds like Nico <laughs> a little bit. Like a Nico thing. There's something about like her intonation and pronunciation um, that I feel like has has existed in the Luhan verse. Am I am I wrong? Am I right or am I right? Um, yeah, all tomorrow's parties is great. Okay. I just like the way that she pronounces the S on that. Tomorrow's parties. I can't even do the um, the S like that. It's hard to force that. I think it's like a natural thing. Parties. It's like a, I can't explain it. You, you, you know, if you guys are listening and you haven't heard the Velvet Underground with Nico, just, just check it out. She's got a very interesting pronunciation of words that's very entrancing um, and very like artsy, like art school kind of vibe, you know? Okay. Um, shift F5. We're getting there, guys. We're getting there very slowly, but surely. I just have to get this hair. And then I, I missed her dress before. I thought I had isolated out all the. All the white. So these will go pretty quick, but I am guessing by four. I'm, I'm hoping. Let's hope it's not 10 times longer. Um, I'm hoping by four to be done with this flatting. A toast and butter shirt. <laughs> Paul said, I have a toast and butter shirt uh, that I bought from Keith Knight. That's awesome. Do you guys remember uh, Milk and Cheese? That was a great little parody comic. I think it was, who was that? Evan Dorkin? Back in the day, that was great. Just hearing toast and butter reminds me of that. I've told you guys to check out Bread Barbershop, have I? Have I told you to check out Bread Barbershop? If I haven't, you guys should check out Bread Barbershop. It is one of my favorite things. <laughs> it's a show like my son and wife and I got into like a year or two ago. And it's like, it's so smart and great. As a lot of it's CG animation, but it's like, it's just so fun. Like the storylines are great. Um, and it's, it's literally about a slice of bread. Who's a barber uh, for other foods. It's literally a food with faces. Um, cartoon. And I, I absolutely love it with a carton of milk named Wilk. And uh, it is, it is excellent. Excellent. <laughs> That's a fair point. Paul was saying I wouldn't be able to write because like this is in a writer's room, but because I'd be laughing at Jim the whole time. It's true. Jim is 
Um, if you guys have not had the luxury of hanging out with Jim, not only is he like a really great animator who writes really solid comedy, um, but dude is just, I mean, you guys have seen on art casters and stuff, but, but yeah, Jim is just genuinely one of the funniest people, um, you know, you'll, you'll ever hang out with. Like he's, he's just on all the time, um, with the humor and it's great. He's a good guy too. So it's not, not like he's just like a snarky jerk, but you mean him, you know, um, but he's very funny. Always, always very funny. <laughs> Frank said, Jim keeps changing his address. I can't find him to hang out. Okay, so we have our um, our lips here, and then from there we'll kind of move on to the other things. Now we'll have our skin tone. Oh, we need the eyeballs, the eyeballs. Paul said, I think I'm behind. Are you saying behind on the, the playlist? Like, oh, on the stream, I'm guessing. And uh, Paul also said, you're a foot in my heart, Frank. <laughs> I love it. Um, all right. Okay, so we have this stuff kind of hanging here. Okay, so we're going to deselect this character here, and then we'll just get through the home stuff. Homes. That would be funny if everything that home does, Dan Daniel Douglas home, the character in this story, ends with, like, if everything he said ended with homes, where he's like, what do you mean, homes, you know? He's like, yes, but there are several ways in which my betrothed does not interest me in the least. Holmes. <laughs> you think the writer would mind if I did <laughs> If I just added Holmes after everything Holmes says? It's like, what? He's home. So it's his tagline. Paul said for a second there, I thought it turned into an urban graphic novel. <laughs> okay, so we are deselecting the uh, shirt here. 
the jacket, les jaquettes, And now we will do our um, eye color, which I think is the same as the vest color, but and then we'll do the hair color after that. So eye color. Do, do. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do our, um, oh, one problem I have when I cartoon, do you guys have this? I kind of do this, like I, I arch down and then my neck feels all weird after. And I, I've drawn like that for years where like my head's like that. So it's like my posture when I draw is just not the best. <laughs> and, uh, that I, I, I would say like, that's one of those things like an older artist might tell you when you're drawing, like, Hey, watch your posture. That's going to hurt years later. And you're like, ah, whatever, whatever old man. And then you like, you start feeling it, you know, and you're like, Oh man, should have had better form and posture when I was drawing. <laughs> Cause it's like hard to get into it without being like, mm, no, let me look very close in here. You know, that kind of thing. So, um, Paul says one of the most annoying things is trying to use the same color from page to page. Yes, it is really annoying. And it's, and it's funny cause I'll feel really bored with it where I'm just like, Oh, like I want to change the palette. But then it's like, when I see it in sequence, it's like, Oh, it's like these very short scenes, you know? Um, but it just feels like, again, like we're, we're playing this in slow motion. So it's like, oh, again, again, with that pink, uh, you know, drapery. Ugh. But, I, you know, in reality, it's just like, oh, there's like a five second scene that has pink drapes, you know. I have an easel now, Josh. Paul said it helps a ton with my posture. Do you really draw on an easel? Because an easel is like not a bad idea. I've thought about, you know, like mounting the um, the screen to be like higher when I'm working, you know, so I could. But it's like I've known too many friends who got like standing desks that are all like way, you know, exquisite and they spend a money, a bunch of money and time on it. They're like, this is going to help my back. And then they did it for like a week and we're like, nah, I'm just going to go back to sitting. This is just weird. <laughs> or they get like back pain from like standing. And it's like, oh, well, I don't know. Again, I'm not speaking as a scientist. Okay, we're almost there. There's two little sections that I see that I missed selecting oh actually three little sections one of them not so little which is the hair so we'll get to that we'll get there one of them's this section okay one of them is the interior of the mouth i thought i was done for a second there just when i thought i was out okay um And then there's this section. And then we'll get into this business here. Let's, the, let's de deselect that. Um. Oh, you know what? Do it easy peasy way. 
So here it's all correct. And then here, I just have to, this actually works out fairly well. Paul says, um, just a small thing where your tablet isn't flat on the table. It's sort of facing you. Tremendous help for me and my issues, which have been significant. I actually kind of wonder if I did that, like tilted it up. Because that would be better on my wrist, you know. Because, like, I do get hand pain. And I have had to get, like, a cortisone injection in my uh, my left hand because of all the actions and stuff I use. And so not in my hand, but it's like in the joint um, where where the um, the radius and ulna connect to the um, the ball joint for my uh, finger, my thumb. It was like right right in there. So you can only get like I think two of those or I, I don't know. I know it's like a minimal amount that you can get before it really starts doing damage and they end up just having to cut the, uh, the tendons. So it's like, I definitely should keep in mind those, um, those kind of preserving things. That's part of why I've been exercising a lot too. I want to maintain my strength, uh, so that I don't have to get a bunch of shots later on. Okay. Um, that'll do it guys. We finished this page. Um, let me see if there's a way I can, show you all well we'll just zoom in so you can see each bit so there's the sequence got it going to there and then to here and that's it so we finished the page um and we're, we're gonna call it for the stream so if you guys haven't yet you've been enjoying this or you like my streams i hit like you know Hit subscribe, hit the bell so you get notifications when I'm about to go live. Uh, maybe tell a friend about it. Um, and I will try to stream hopefully later today. You know what? Let me show you a sneak peek of a robot turtle. Hold on. I'll show you a sneak peek of what we'll be working on next stream. And I can't say who this is for. But, uh, but it's a client. And we're going to be working on that. A robot turtle being worked on by a robot. So uh, that'll be fun to actually finalize. I had finalized it before, but it was a little too complex. So we're going to pare it down and kind of redo it uh, simp more simply. And uh, that'll be on the next stream. So make sure you're, uh, you've hit the, the like button and stuff. I will see you guys on the next stream. I appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah, um, after this, after this is done, if you haven't yet, make sure you watch the full fungus trailer. Make sure you pick up uh, Paul Pate's books, his Detective Perez books, because there's another one coming. And uh, make sure you support Frank, Captain Courage, Captain Goggles, and Roll for Taraco. And uh, with all that being said, uh, make sure you guys have picked up uh, Jacob's apartment and two stories. Appreciate you guys, and I will see you on the next one. Goodbye.